We'll try to help. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our space. Welcome to our service. We hope uh, those who are joining us on Facebook and YouTube are settling in as well as we get started in a lovely conversation here this morning. Um, we're going to have another story time. So I hope you had your juice and cookies. The nap comes after, not during. Okay. So I uh, just want to recognize that we have crossed over into sacred space. So allow your heart and your mind to let go of anything that you've been carrying up until this moment. You've come into the church. So we want to recognize, you know, the, the word church itself comes, we get it from our of course, the New Testament tradition, and it has a Greek origin, ekklesia is the Greek word for church, and it literally means, because you have in that word ekklesia, kaleo, which means to be called, uh, and ekklesia means to be called out from the world. So when you come into church, you're being called away from or out of the world system, right? It's a very different perception that is being inculcated and cultivated within the sacred space of the church. So that when we come in here, we're able to actually put aside and drop away from what we've been doing in the world. That's why, you know, oftentimes in those grand cathedrals, when you would walk across the threshold from the outer world of commerce and busyness and frantic go-getting, you would walk into a place and those doors would shut and there would be a whoosh. And you would look up in these great Gothic cathedrals. I'm thinking of St. John the Divine in New York City. And you are just transported into a very different world. The whole symbol system is different. The whole architecture is different. The space, the feeling, the smells, the sounds, all different and very still, very quiet. And it's designed to open you up and lift you up. Right? That's the idea of that Gothic architecture. It's designed to bring your energy field up so that when we come into church, we're literally being called out of limitation. We're being called out of the, <clears throat> the way of thinking that keeps us small and limited. And we're going to be looking at this today in our story time. <clears throat> <laughs> You know, we never stop being five. You know that, right? We just become a little more sophisticated five-year-olds. But the, the idea is that um, we are learning anew. We're learning afresh, I would hope, on the past several Sundays that we've been working through the Old and New Testament teachings of the biblical spiritual tradition, <clears throat> that we're, we're hopefully injecting new ideas, new understanding, new meaning, into these old and familiar stories because oftentimes they've been co-opted by a world, right? A culture that doesn't lift you up, that doesn't bring you into the transcendent space of your own sacred nature. It kind of confines you into another rule system that you have to obey because you're guilty. And that's the way that we have to live our life religiously. And so the Bible is oftentimes misused and if it's not being misused to make you feel guilty, it's oftentimes being misused to think that you should get on that consumerism, feverish uh, you know, drive to get, so that now you're using the Bible as the way of attracting wealth, you know, that prosperity gospel. And there's nothing wrong with being you know, fulfilled and satisfied and wealthy, but that is not what the Bible was about originally. It's about opening you up to the abundance of God and then watching the blessings unfold naturally in your life. You're not the one who's doing it. Right? That's the culture that you're being called out from. Right? So this story time today brings us right back to the beginning. We've been talking about this over the past few weeks. The... Um, the opening chapter of Genesis, it has, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Remember, we had a whole service about that one little letter in the Hebrew alphabet, which is the letter Beit, which means house, but it's also the idea of distinction where you have inside of a house and you have outside the house. <clears throat> and that's the beginning. You know, the rabbis have been spilling a lot of ink over this for centuries, that this word, this letter, really, is the 
real core of what the Bible's wanting us to learn. And that is you have to make these clear distinctions between the sacred and the profane, between God's will and man's will. And if you blur or skew those distinctions, you live in a wilderness where you don't have any direction. And so the, the Bible's clear about the idea of making these distinctions in relationship to God, and that was the original setting of the human couple. They were in an environment that was in relationship to God. In fact, they were, get, they were granted their identity from God, right? God breathed the breath of life into the human being, and it became a living soul. And then that human being was given a capacity, it says, to name all of creation, right? Remember this story? Adam named all the animals in the garden, <clears throat> and the Quran picks this up and actually says that these names, these isma, are the beautiful names of God, and it's the secret codes of the life essences of all things. And so, according to the Quran, when God gave Adam the power to name, which is even beyond the angels, it also gave Adam the ability to be the Khalifa, the, the one that is actually the, the regent or representative of God on the planet. But not in a dominating way. Because when you're in relationship with your supreme self or source, there is a, um, as it says in the Genesis account, that Adam and Eve were to be the Oved and the Shomer. They were to be the caretakers, the stewards, and the protectors of nature. A, a, a role of compassion, a role of wisdom and compassion for the natural order, knowing that they have a capacity because of that breath of God that gave them access to what animal kingdoms don't have, they were to bridge the divine into the natural and care for it, perfect it, raise it up, bring it into its, its fullest expressions. Right? That was the, the perfect um, plan. And then, lo and behold, comes the guy from the side of the stage with the long mustache, you know, the serpent in the garden. <clears throat> and this is where the distinctions get blurred. The distinctions get blurred because now you can actually be the one in control. You can be Elohim. You can be God. You don't have to give your authority to the supreme creator, you can be the authority. You can govern your own life, call your own shots, direct your own path, and do what you will. That shall be the whole of the law. And so this is where the distinctions between the sacred and the profane get skewed so terribly that now Adam and Eve are in shame. They don't even have that um, good rapport with their origin, their source. And so they find themselves in a place where uh, they no longer have that sense of compassion and wisdom for creation. They have a sense of wanting to dominate and control. And nature is going to respond in kind, it says, that there's going to be blowback uh, with this new perception that nature is going to actually make it difficult for you now. You're going to have difficulty in bearing children. You're going to have difficulty in making your way in the world because things are not always going to flow smoothly because you're at a sink with your source. You're literally blocking the source from your mind. So then the next thing we talked about a couple of weeks ago is that uh, Adam and Eve had a firstborn son, and the name of Cain, right, the firstborn son, represents a way of thinking about yourself, right? Because remember what we're saying, we're injecting new meaning, new life into these scriptures. And what we're looking at is we're taking away the dogma and the religiosity and the encrusted cultural enculturation that we've had on it, that we couldn't see what was going on. Underneath it all, these are fundamental paradigms, archetypes, forces, elements that form and shape human psychology, sociology, and theology. We're all repeating these patterns. We're swimming in it. We just don't know it. 
right? You, you know that, that parable of the fish meeting the fish? And one fish says to the other fish, like, I hear all this talk about the ocean. What, what is this ocean that people keep talking about while they're swimming in it? Right? And that's meant to be the enlightened state of mind. But in our conversation right now, we're kind of these fish swimming in the ocean of culture. And we're like, what's culture? You know? we're, we're, be, we're wearing culture. We're thinking culture. We're, we're surrounded by culture. We just don't think, we don't make these key distinctions. And that's why, you know, again, in this idea, and, and don't think this is like some kind of trite little thing. As Terence McKenna was famous in saying, culture is not your friend. Culture is not your friend. Because our dominating culture is a dominator culture. And this is what we have to look at when it comes to Cain. Cain is the paradigm of our present day culture and has been the paradigm of all cultures that human beings have created. And that is, I did this for myself, I'm making a name for myself, and my success comes at your cost. In order for me to succeed, I have to rob, steal, and kill from those that I can. There you have human history. And it goes on till this day. Again, like we said about being five years old, and we've just become a little more sophisticated in being five, cultures around the world, including our own, have been this dominator, canite perspective on life, only because we're living in a culture that's dominated by the dominators, we're getting a story that we're the good guys. And if you can't make these distinctions, then you'll just be domesticated in this culture and go to sleep. And remember what we're saying, the Bible interrupts that. That's the message of the Bible. It interrupts the dominator culture. Because what's going on is that when, let's say, Moses comes along in the story, Moses is, again, another paradigmatic character. He's the archetype of the prophet, the one who hears from God and gives the message of God to the people. Now, who are the people in the story of Moses? They're those people that are oppressed, enslaved, um, taken advantage of by the dominator culture of Egypt. And so Moses is told by God that God hears the cry of these oppressed people. And it's that part of the story that we're going to pick up on today, right? Uh, one of the things that you have to recognize sitting here in church, being called out from the world, is that we have to first make these key distinctions where we start to separate who we are from the enculturation or cultural programming we received. And that could be very tricky business. That's part of the fundamental journey of the spiritual path is to cultivate discernment, the ability to suss out the real from the unreal. And one of the things that will impede that process of, of recognizing your part of this dominator culture of you know, creating empire through illusion, manipulation, and lies is that you're lying to yourself. And you're operating from a very selfish point of view. It's all about me. If it's all about me, it's about me making a name for myself, getting what I want, no matter who suffers for it. And so if I'm operating in any way, shape, or form along that paradigm of Cain, then this is going to smart, this conversation. It's going to hurt because there's a part of my mind that is invested in that culture, that gets juice from that culture, that there's some kind of a payoff to being selfish. And we've been brought up to think that. 
So it's not like you're abnormal if this is happening. But if you're here in church, there's a bit of an onus put upon you to say, okay, well, you've made it this far. And if you really want to see the benefits of coming into the physical building, then do the inner spiritual work. And that is recognize that when you're not operating from a politic or a theology of wisdom and compassion, you will suffer pain and loss and struggle in your life. Somewhere, somehow. Physically, emotionally, psychologically, financially. If you're not aligning yourself to the, the true authority, remember, which is giving us a wisdom and compassion way of being, we will oftentimes find ourselves in disaster. And, and that is the story. That's actually how um, Israel ended up in Egypt. Right? They entered into uh, a disaster cycle, as it says. And so we want to pick up that story um, in this book, uh, Walter Brueggemann's The Prophetic Imagination. Fantastic book. Brueggemann, again, if you haven't heard me say this before, a celebrated Old Testament scholar, one of the best in his field, very charismatic. Uh, if you were to watch some of his videos on YouTube, he gets into the social, political, and theological ideas of the Old Testament and shows how meaningful and profoundly important it is to our day and age. Because though the settings have changed, the storyline has not. We are in the same situation as Israel was in Egypt, period. And again, we're swimming in it, so we don't always see it. Plus, if we've been in this part of America, we're quite insulated. We're quite numb. Go to Camden, Massachusetts. Go look there. Go look in other parts of this country. If you travel around the country, you see it. It's not uh, America the beautiful. And you know, remember, this is not to bring you down and keep you down, but there's going to be a, a need to uh, sort of jar us out of the hypnotic spell of our culture. And the myth that we keep hearing from the culture and the leaders of the culture. So this is really important stuff. I hope you are, you're enjoying it. And it's just going to get more unsettling and difficult to listen to. <laughs> so be joyful. So uh, Brueggemann starts out his chapter, um, The Alternative Community of Moses, right? This is what's necessary. What's necessary, and this is really the, the whole brunt of our talk this morning, is a reimagining of culture, a reimagining of who you are. And that requires, in order to reimagine, that requires a true alternative on who you are, what you are, and who everybody else is. You can't just reimagine something within the same cultural framework that you stay in. There's no reimagining there. It's just reappropriation. You're just moving furniture on the Titanic. You gotta go to another level of perception in order to reimagine what's being described here in the, the context of the church, right? Being called out from the world. So Brueggemann says this, the contemporary American church is so largely enculturated to the American ethos of consumerism that it has little power to believe or to act. The, this enculturation is in some way true across the spectrum of church life, both liberal and conservative. It may not be a new situation, but it is one that seems especially urgent and pressing at the present time. That enculturation is true not only of the institution of the church, but also of us as persons. Right? We've been enculturated. We're carrying on 
It's like, you know, if you were to look at, you know, ever hear the word meme? It's become increasingly more pop popular. A meme is like these bits of information that basically contain um, the paradigm of something that is, is encapsulated in a small way. And memes have been likened to viruses. And so we have cultural memes. And they're going to be getting into your internal chatter while we're talking about this stuff this morning. And so you'll be able to come across how we've been programmed or we're carrying a virus. And we are un unaware of the fact that we have been infected as persons, right? So we can abstract and say, okay, so at large, generally speaking, but no, this is also deeply personal in the way that we think about ourselves and our life and our family and our relationships and what we want and what's important to us. Right? That's why in the Seth group that we have on Tuesday evenings, uh, if you're familiar with the teachings of the Seth material, wonderful stuff. But Seth is basically saying that in order for us to be authentic human beings, to know who we are as soul, right, as spiritual entities, we have to undergo deep, rigorous self-examination. Without self-examination, we are being co-opted by other people's ideas. And then we give our power away, we acquiesce, and we become followers of somebody else's plan or dream or idea. And that is the fundamental difference between the awake and the asleep. So rigorous self-examination, says Seth, is something that we have to do for ourselves, honestly, authentically, moment by moment. Seth also, Seth also says that because this requires a deep looking at yourself and a constant readjustment of what you think and what you believe and what's true, most people don't want to do that. And as a result, they become willing dupes. That's why if you remember the story of Exodus, when they leave Egypt, right, Pharaoh's armies drowned in the Red Sea and they go into the wilderness, it's not long after that that what happens? They start groaning and complaining. Moses took us out here to kill us. We had it pretty good in Egypt. We had leeks and onions and garlic, and we had a place to sleep, and now look at where we are. And it's showing how they were enculturated. That even though they were breaking their backs and making bricks and getting beat by the taskmasters and completely oppressed, in that transition period where now they're going into the wilderness of self-examination, the empire didn't look so bad. That's why it says in that story that for 40 years they had to wander on an 11-day journey, right? It would have only taken them 11 days <laughs> to get from point A to point B, but they took 40 years because of the complaining and the grumbling and the hanging on to the past and the refusal to open up to the new and to open up to the fact that there was a higher power that was coming into their life to, to lead and guide them. No, it's, it's what I want to do. So you can see, even the oppressed are keen if they're not doing this rigorous self-examination. You can't be oppressed within a dominator hierarchy if you're not playing their game. You have to be playing their game. So it's, it's good to be a victim, it's good to complain, and it's good not to take responsibility and empower yourself because somebody else is at fault. So just like, you know, at the dominator level, I have to take what, what is yours, your resources, your stuff that I want for my empire, for what would make me stronger and happier and bigger. Well, the victim is, I get to take your innocence. I get to be innocent, and you get to be guilty. So that's why activism in that paradigm of fighting against the bad guy 
and yelling and hating and screaming at the oppressor, you're, you're just making that stronger. You have to get out of it. Go. Right? So this is the idea then that we have been enculturated personally, and so we're going to have to look at ourselves through deep self-examination. You know, I don't know if that brings you down, but eventually it's going to bring you up. Right? Actually, Brueggemann says that at one point. <coughs> Listen to this. So our sociology is predictably derived from, legitimated by, and reflective of our theology. Right? So sociology, what we think is the right relationship for people in society, goes hand in hand with our ultimate concern and what we think is ultimate reality. They're patterned on each other. So you can't have a theology without sociology. And you can't have a sociology without a theology. Everything relates back to ultimate reality. What's ultimately real dictates how we treat one another. You see? So sociology is predictably derived from, legitimated by, and reflective of our theology. And if we gather around a static God of order who only guards the interests of the haves, oppression cannot be far behind. So big tech, big pharma, multinational corporations, these are the static gods of our day. In the, in the past, it was, you know, um, Osiris and Horus and Ta sitting in their, you know, stone thrones in the monuments of Egypt and the pyramid structures of Egypt. Now, it's the big high-rise corporate buildings in the big metropolises. Those are the monuments to Pharaoh. This is how we have to wake up. We have to see. We have to come out of the stupor. So oppression cannot be far behind when the static God of order only protects the interests of the haves. Right? Conversely, if a God is disclosed who is free to come and go, free from and even against the regime, free to hear and even answer slave cries, free from all proper godness as defined by the empire, right? proper godness defined by the empire, then it will bear decisively upon sociology because the freedom of God will surface in the brickyards and manifest itself as justice and compassion. In other words, the blue-collar, the underserved, the poor, the needy, the oppressed, the orphan, the widow, they have to be brought in. Otherwise, you have a sick society based completely and entirely on ingratiating the haves and ignoring the have-nots. And, and remember, this is all in reflection to our ultimate concern. I, I hope I'm doing you a service here this morning, that when we talk about the transcendent, which we do, and I bring in all of these ideas that blow the doors off of your conceptual thinking and you go into higher spaces of God union and enlightened understanding. It's all got to be brought back down and integrated. It's got to be integrated into who you are, how you show up, how you see the world. That's clear seeing. That's wisdom in action. And our politics need to reflect our understanding. Otherwise, we're hypocrites. Is this making sense? 
And, you know, I'm not giving you fire and brimstone here, but there is a bit of a hammer in my hand to break up the crust that's been on the surface of the mind, keeping us in the shadow of false beliefs. So, Brueggemann says, uh, that enculturation is true not only of the institution of the church, but also of us as persons. Our consciousness has been claimed by false fields of perception and idolatrous systems of language and rhetoric. Our consciousness has been claimed by false fields of perception, language, and rhetoric. What's rhetoric? You know, again, this is something really important because we're en entering a new election cycle. And one of the things that you can say is a mainstay of the establishment is they promise you everything and give you nothing. This is, you know, one of the reasons why we're, we're having to make this paradigmatic shift in our world is because we're growing as spiritual beings. We can't tolerate lies within our own internal system. That will block our growth and development. Well, it's only a matter of extending who we are because we are the environment. We are one another. This is what we're learning, yes? So we cannot tolerate lies within the greater self. It's not that we become angry and, and hateful and reactionary. We have to see through it. But if we're still caught because our, our mind has been appropriated through language and rhetoric to go to sleep, sleep, then the next election cycle or whatever it is that comes in, we're just buying it face value. No deeper critical understanding of what's behind the words. What are they really doing? This was Plato's big gripe with what he called the, the uh, sophists. Right? Uh, if we look at the history of philosophy, we're in a culture now of sophistry. Sophistry is where we're using language and rhetoric to promise you everything and tell you we feel your pain. We really do. And we're going to do something about it. And you need to do something about it too because democracy is on the line. Democracy. Democracy for who? So don't get bought into the rhetoric of the culture. The, those who are, this is why Jesus was dangerous. This is why the military industrial complex of Rome and the false religionists of Jerusalem wanted to murder the guy because of this. He's bringing a new order into consciousness. Yes, you're loving Father, and you're going to go into states of bliss and rapture. Yes, prayer life and watchfulness of your deeper nature, and that's going to all hatch, and you're going to literally be birthed into light. Soma Christu, the, the body of Christ, is going to emerge in you. You're going to be a light being, even while here. That's what a hagioi is. That's what the saints are. They're beings of light in time. And Jesus had a social policy. The government shall be on his shoulders, Isaiah chapter 9. Right? This is the idea. It has to be integrated. And so people that were listening to him and truly taking in the information were getting a different social paradigm from the prophets, from this long history that is the biblical tradition as the interruption to empire and the dominator culture. Right? To liberate you from being oppressed. 
So he says, Brueggemann, uh, this is his, his whole hypothesis, that the task of the prophetic ministry is to nurture, nourish, and evoke a consciousness and perception alternative to the consciousness and perception of the dominant culture around us. You're born again. You come out of the sleep. You're no longer looking at things in a two-party system or even a geopolitical paradigm. You're out of that sleep because it's all one game. Am I going too far this morning? It's all one game. And Cain, the, the mentality of Cain, is, is really the paradigm that all these ge geopolitical forces are following. Take what you can get. Social Darwinism, survival of the fittest. Right makes, uh, might makes right. Whoever has the big guns controls the game board. Do you want to live? You want to pass this world on to, an, to the next generation? Maybe it can't even be passed on. We're, we're lining up nukes on the border of Finland and Russia right now. We're putting U.S. troops on the ground in Ukraine in uniform, provoking Russia. Do you want to live in a world like that? Well, then wake up. Don't buy the rhetoric. Be the light. Be the voice of the alternative, not out of anger and judgment, but out of love and compassion. So Brueggemann says, I suggest that prophetic ministry has to do not primarily with addressing specific public crises, but with addressing in season and out of season the dominant crisis that is enduring and resilient. What's the dominant crisis? Of having our alternative vocation co opt it and domesticate it. Our alternative vocation to be the light is co opted and domesticated. Uh, again, you know. I, I didn't intend to come here and, and, and speak like this this morning, but you know what? I'm getting taken over, so so be it. Uh, you know what? Did you ever hear of The Intercept? It's a semi-independent publication. Um, Glenn Greenwald, uh, who broke the Snowden story back in 2013, he founded The Intercept, but since left The Intercept because they were taken over by billionaires and they didn't want Green, Greenwald's honesty, so he walked away. Um, but they actually did good this week. They published an article on how the Department of Homeland Security has backdoor access to all social media platforms. And they can literally edit, take away, silence any dissenting voices that speak against the establishment, the national security state, the empire. So, hmm? Yeah. And so this is what we're looking at then when he says that um, the dominant crisis is the enduring, enduring and resilient um, uh, co-opting of the voice of truth. And, and what was our country founded on? Free speech. First, that devolved into free speech zones. You had to go to a certain place if you were fighting against something or wanting to speak against something. You had to be in a free speech zone that the law you know, suggested, or not suggested, and insisted that you be in. But now free speech is becoming less and less of a reality. Again, only to stir you up, not to depress you, but to open the eyes to this cultural hypnotism that still is going on. So then the alternative consciousness, the alternative consciousness to be nurtured is twofold. Right? So as we begin to say yes to who we are as spiritual beings and realize that our theology or our relationship to the supreme source is also our sociology, right? I hope this is also something very helpful for you. 
that you, as St. John says in one of his epistles, you who say that you love God and hate your brother are a hypocrite. How can you say you love God and yet despise his creation? The two go together. They're not apart. You can't just go off on your own, love God, and get enlightened and, and think that people are going to have to fend for themselves. No, you have to bring the compassion through. You have to bring the love through. And this includes people that are on different sides of the aisle. This kind of love doesn't choose sides. It, it looks through the acculturation. It looks through the false belief systems, and it sees the, the mark of God in every living being. Right? This is the prophetic vision. And he's saying that there are two ways that this has to start to really take root in the mind. One is that the prophetic vision serves to criticize the dominant consciousness in a healthy way, what we're doing right now. We're, in a healthy way, critiquing the dominator hierarchy. Right? On the, uh, and this engages in, the re in rejecting and delegitimizing the present order of things. Okay. Now, we're going to bring this home to a, a deeper spiritual uh, experience this morning, but these pieces have to come together, I hope, at the level in which we're addressing them right now. Right? We have to delegitimize what we're doing as a, as a country. Oppression. Like, again, I have to throw out these factoids because I don't think we're, we're getting it if we're only turning in, tuning into the corporate-owned media that are owned by the established billionaires that want the status quo to continue. So if you're getting your information from MSNBC and CNN and Fox, you're literally just getting the information from the ruling elite and what they want to tell you. The news readers are stenographers for the intelligence community. There's no, uh, you know, uh, real journalism going on there. So this idea then is to recognize we have to delegitimate, reject, and criticize this. So one of the, the major critiques is when we had our COVID pandemic, again, I don't know why I'm going here. I'm just going with it. When we had our COVID pandemic, how many little businesses were shut down? Big businesses were let, let to stay open. And then we had to wait forever for a $1,200 check, right? And at the time, uh, Trump's uh, financial guy, I forget his name right now, but he said that, that $1,200 should carry people over for the next 10 weeks. And at the same time that the COVID hit, it wasn't more than a week that the Federal Reserve was pouring a trillion dollars a day into Wall Street, a trillion dollars a day. And then the CARES Act was signed into law. And that was the greatest upward transfer of wealth in human history. Bill Gates, uh, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and a few other billionaires doubled their wealth. Doubled their wealth. Immediately, they got their checks. We had to wait for our 1,200 for weeks and weeks and weeks. So this is what we're talking about. When you start to see this utter corruption, you have to delegitimize that voice. No matter how charismatic, good-looking, what they're telling you, they feel your pain. You got to delegitimize that. No more. Otherwise, you're going to go back to sleep. 
And then God can't really work in bringing the wisdom and compassion into reality to help. All right. <sighs> so, um, again, Brueggemann says that the functional qualifiers, critical and energizing, are important. And he suggests that the dominant culture now and in every time is grossly uncritical, cannot tolerate serious and fundamental criticism, and will go to great lengths to, to stop it. Right? Conversely, the dominant culture is a wearied culture, nearly unable to be seriously energized to new promises from God. Right? Can't change. Doesn't want to change. Right? Something new has to happen. Is this too heavy for you guys? No? So, finishing up here with Brueggemann. Really important stuff here. Okay. So, the point that prophetic imagination must ponder is that there is no freedom of God without the politics of justice and compassion. And there is no politics of justice and compassion without the freedom of God. And that means then when we're here every morning on Sunday and we go into these places of surrender and enlightened understanding and feeling the holy presence and sacred space, that is one part of the equation. We're getting downloaded with information. The other part of the equation is to bring that out. Right? This is what Jesus says in A Course in Miracles. You go in from revelation, where you're in intimacy with your source. But then that revelation has to be translated into the giving of the miracles, which is the love and the compassion, to unite the society into the one self that it is. And when we begin to see this in action, start wherever you want to start. Start with your kids or your grandkids, the lady at the grocery store, wherever. Begin to be completely free in your expression of love and compassion and no longer look to the culture to get your marching orders and what's right and what's wrong. You become a free agent. And that's why he says uh, the program of the prophetic is to reimagine a new world, right? That's what we're doing. We're reimagining a new world. And that is nothing less than a total dismantling of the consciousness of the empire. It's aimed at nothing less than a complete denial of the empire, both in its social practices and the story, the narrative that it's telling itself and wants us to believe. Okay, so again, last thing here with Brueggemann. This is how it begins. This is how things begin to fire into action. And that is you get in touch with where you are in this situation. He says, it is through the act of crying out that the change begins to take place because the one who's crying out begins to actually petition the higher self for a reimagining. If you're not crying out, you're acquiescing to the sophistry, the rhetoric, and the national narrative. You're just going along with status quo. It's like an addiction, right? Our, our culture is very much like a narcotic. In fact, Brueggemann talks about it in those terms. We've been narcoticized by culture. And if we're addicts and we're still getting our narcotic from our culture, we're not going to cry out, hey, man, how's it going, man? <laughs> yeah, we got to fund the military some more, man. Yeah, the, the progressives are going to do it this year, man. Yeah. 
Democrats are good. They're going to take care of things. No. We have to cry out, when you're done with your addiction, you seek the higher power to intervene. That's step one. That's what we're talking about here. And what we're also talking about is the myth of the Exodus. We are every person in that story. We are Pharaoh. We do have those taskmasters in our own psychology to keep down those ideas that want freedom. Are they happening in, in your listening right now? Are those taskmasters coming in? Shut up. Don't go there. Make those bricks. Stay in line. Follow orders. Obey. But we're also Moses. We have that voice that actually is being influenced from above and beyond. And we can actually begin to marshal that. And we are the Israelites that want to get out of the oppression, but still have ties and feelings and, and um, a bit of an addiction to the empire. One of the things you got to see, and, and I don't know if you're, you're getting it, feeling it, sensing it, but the prophetic message, if it's really coming through in a, in a genuine way, is unsettling. It has to be. It's, it's upsetting. It's interrupting what we've been conditioned to believe. This is all part of awakening. So A Course in Miracles has some interesting things to say within this whole paradigm of leaving behind the world of dominator ego beliefs. Right? He says, the world you see must be denied, for sight of it is costing you a different kind of vision. You cannot see both worlds. For each world involves a different kind of seeing and depends on what you cherish. Right? Service to self or service to others that includes yourself, right? Selfishness or self-fullness. Two different words. Two different things that are two different principles to live by. And the one that you cherish is the world that you'll see. Both worlds are not true, yet either one will seem as real to you as the amount to which you hold it dear. And yet their power is not the same because their real attraction to you is unequal. You do not really want the world you see, for it has disappointed you since time began. The homes you built have never sheltered you. The roads you made have led you nowhere. And no city that you built has withstood the crumbling assault of time. Nothing you made but has the mark of death upon it. Hold it not, dear, for it is old and tired and ready to return to dust even as you made it. This aching world has not the power to touch the living world at all. You could not give it that, and so although you turn in sadness from this world, you cannot find in the world the road that leads away from it into another world. But the real world has the power to touch you even here because you love it, and what you call with love will come to you. So in other words, this culture is like the ocean we're swimming in. All pervading. And it seems like there's no way out of it. So even when maybe we're in this conversation, there was a bit of hopelessness. Like, well, what, what, what is that then? What, what do we do? There's nowhere else to go. But he's saying you can't see it while you're swimming in it. But there's another world that will come to you if you call for it. Remember the cry is how this whole thing starts. 
the cry to the higher power, which is love. And so that cry, he says, is the love that always answers. So when you're authentically crying out for it, you will be answered. So love always answers being unable to deny a call for help or not to hear the cries of pain that rise to it from every part of this strange world you made but do not want. The only effort you need make to give this world away in glad exchange for one you did not make, that God made, is willingness to learn the world you made is false, illegitimate, right? That's the critique that we've been talking about this morning. Delegitimize the world you made. Don't blame other people for making it. You're projecting it. It's living inside of your mind. But when you delegitimize that world and cry for the real world, you will be answered. Your spirituality will take a quantum leap. And it will begin to include every living being and usher in a completely new world. Blue bag's going to go around. So what do you guys think? Talk to me. Will we see for president? <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> Anything? Patience. Irreverent in a good way. Mm-hmm. I got that from you. That's why I was spreading the gospel. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And the truthful exception for purity and the That's right. That's right. The truth will set you free right after it pisses you off. (laughs) We bless the offering. We just charge it with the intention to bring all minds into their true nature, that we may have a society built on wisdom and compassion and love and see that in our lifetime. And so it is. Amen. All right, my friends, let's seal the deal. Resting within the heart, within the still point, where we can lay our burdens down and come to be refreshed and restored and renewed by the the indwelling presence of Holy Spirit within the heart. And as we breathe in the holy air within the temple of the heart, we are reminded that the light of God surrounds us, the love of God enfolds us, the power of God protects us, and the presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Have a beautiful day. I'm I'm actually giving the 1030, so uh, if you haven't had enough, come back. Take some Tums and come back. And A Course in Miracles, of course, tomorrow, 7.15, if you want to join us for that. See y'all.